Welcome to the Banned and Censored Animations Iceberg Part 2. You did hear that right. If you haven't seen Part 1 to the Iceberg, go ahead and go watch that. It'll be in the top right as a card, or go ahead and go to the description below as I will leave a link to that. Let's pick up right where we left off on Layer 4, but not without a quick word from today's sponsor, NordVPN. That's right, fellas. We made it. You know you're a real YouTuber when NordVPN sponsors you. This is because NordVPN is one of the best when it comes to using any virtual private network. If you're using the internet in today's day and age without a VPN, you should seriously consider getting one. If you use my link in the description, not only does it help support the channel, but it's also risk-free as NordVPN offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. When I'm researching all these crazy topics from banned animations to disturbing media, it's vital and critical that I use a VPN service to keep all my data secure. If you don't use a VPN when you're on the internet, pretty much all of your internet activity can be traced to whatever device you're using. The only for sure way to stop that is to use a VPN like NordVPN. NordVPN encrypts all of your internet traffic by utilizing next generation technology that is recommended by the NSA. Using their app is surprisingly easy whether you're on a phone or a desktop. All you gotta do is download the app, click on Quick Connect, and boom. You'll be on one of the fastest and safest VPN services with features that block all sorts of malicious software. You can get a two-year plan with four months free by heading over to nordvpn.com slash everydaytheorist. Or just click that tiny link in my description to start surfing the internet risk-free. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. With all of that out of the way, let's get into Layer 4 on the banned and censored animations iceberg. Layer 4 shows off more of what I expected from this iceberg, one-off obscure animations from random episodes that were cut due to having either outdated concepts, scenes that could be taken the wrong way, or just all around plain innocent plots that adults blew way out of proportion. Procrastination. I am just as surprised as anyone else to see this episode on here. Remember that episode where Spongebob procrastinates on his paper on what to do at a stoplight to the point where it takes him hours just to end up with a fancy the on his piece of paper. Yeah, that episode was censored. Surprisingly enough, there were three scenes that were cut from future airings of the episode all the way from mid 2005 until 2019. 14 years. Those scenes were this one where Spongebob looks outside and sees Patrick giving Sandy a shoulder rub while saying, Come on, Spongebob! This was cut because it was deemed too suggestive with adults believing that Patrick was actually unhooking Sandy's bra or at least alluding to that even though in the scene you can clearly see he's giving her a shoulder rub. There's another scene where Spongebob imagines getting his license, which prompts this random footage to play in the background of a race car getting into a fatal car crash. And lastly, there is a scene where Spongebob practices calisthenics next to his desk. This part was removed because of his nose moving up and down in this suggestive manner. Obviously, it's alluding to another type of phallic object that moves up and down like this. But yeah, this scene was said to be too obscene and suggestive, and it was also cut in its entirety. One thing that I feel like is a huge commonality between everything on the iceberg so far is that a lot of these things were kind of unjustly taken off the air. I feel like this one is also one of those. However, Nickelodeon did come to their senses in 2019 as they actually brought back all of the original scenes in their entirety and put them back onto all these streaming services. So if you watch Spongebob on a streaming service like Prime Video or Paramount Plus, you guys will be able to see those scenes in this episode. What's crazy though is that those three scenes cut actually added up to around two to three minutes of total airtime, which is crazy to think about because if you didn't catch this episode when it came out before 2005, then that means from mid 2005 to 2019, there was all this funny jokes and context that was missing for like 14 years. And I imagine that some people out there that watched Spongebob watched one of the other airings of this episode and were surprised to find out when they watched on streaming services that like these three scenes were just seemingly added in even though they were the original cut of the episode. Star vs. the Forces of Evil Star vs. the Forces of Evil is an American cartoon that can be found on Disney+. Plus. This show features a lead named Princess Star Butterfly, who after turning 14 and being given the royal magic wand, is sent to Earth in order to safely practice her newly found powers. It's a pretty simple and cute series to follow from the get-go, and it might leave you wondering why this show, of all things, has a banned episode. Well, 
There is a scene from episode 11 titled The Banagic Wand that might have been a little too suggestive and adult themed for Western audiences. There is a wand featured in the episode that is called the Banagic Wand. It's this wand that's designed to make banana pudding and is also shaped like a banana. It seems innocent enough on the surface, but yeah. <laughs> Disney thought this was too close to an other phallic shaped object that also shoots out a mysterious substance. So they cut the episode in its entirety from TV and Disney Plus. And I'm not gonna lie, I, I kinda have to agree with them on this one because even though it's super innocent, like, come on, man. On a side note, the entirety of the series is actually banned in Syria due to its gay themes. And it has also been censored in Southeast Asia, Portugal, and Turkey. There isn't really a lot else to be said on this one. There is a ton of episodes from this series that were banned in various countries around the world just due to their LGBT themes in the episode. However, I think the Banagic Wand incident is the most notable episode when referring to banned or censored animations on this show. Moms, I'd like to forget. Moms I'd Like to Forget is the 10th episode of season 22 of The Simpsons. This one originally aired on Fox in January of 2011. This entire episode was centered around Marge reconnecting with an old group of moms that she used to be friends with. Throughout the entire episode, it alludes heavily to lesbian themes with the moms and Marge. And the reason the episode was actually banned was because of a scene towards the end of the episode where after Marge leaves her friends, these three women inexplicably begin to make out with each other. This scene has since been removed from airings on any Fox or Fox affiliate channels. There's also a somewhat less controversial scene where Bart blows up these fireworks, which was banned and censored in UK broadcasts of the episode. What's neat about this entry though is that it does still seem to be intact on Disney+. Plus. The Mask of Matches Malone. This is an episode of Batman the Brave and the Bold that was not aired in the US due to a scene where a group of ladies do a very sexual song and dance. The group that does this is called the Birds of Prey, which is made up of the Black Canary, Catwoman, and the Huntress. After watching the scene, I really don't exactly understand why this was banned in the US. It didn't really strike me as sexual at all, and that's me watching it as an adult. Of course, if you watch it yourself, there are all kinds of innuendos and more adult punchlines in the lyrics. But as for the visuals, I just don't think it was ban worthy. I will say this episode did air internationally, but it was specifically banned in the US due to an outrage from parents and guardians that protested the song due to its lyrics and somewhat suggestive visuals. See me, feel me, know me. An episode of the Powerpuff Girls titled See Me, Feel Me, Know Me was banned due to it somehow having a relation to religious imagery. For example, there is this character that looks eerily similar to Jesus Christ, and earlier in the episode, there is this scene with destroyed burning buildings. Some people mistook these metal broken beams as crosses and thought it was a metaphor for burning the cross which if you're unaware is a huge no-no in the Christian and Catholic community. Also, there is another scene that is reminiscent of the Porygon episode of Pokemon, which was controversial due to the strobe light effect that it had. For these reasons, the episode was pulled and banned in the United States on February 27th of 2004. It eventually did make its way back into the US nearly five years later in 2009, when a complete DVD box set was released that included the episode. And it has since been made available on Netflix and Hulu, but strangely enough, the episode is not available on HBO Max. Leap Frogs. This episode of Rocco's Modern Life actually tackled a huge common problem that is seen in a lot of marriages and relationships. This character named Bev is feeling a bit unloved from her husband, Ed, and she keeps on trying to get his attention. And if it's not clear, it is heavily implied throughout the entire ordeal that it's not just love and cuddles that she wants from this entire ordeal if you know what I mean. Feeling neglected, she seeks attention elsewhere. In this case, she sees Rocco mowing his lawn and decides that she suddenly needs help around her house and she needs a man to come in and fix a few things. And she doesn't even try to hide how desperate she is for attention, such as unplugging the VCR and having Rocco fix it. After that part, she actually invites him to the couch in a very 
suggestive manner. I keep saying suggestive, but you guys know what that means. You're going to hear that word a lot because I'm trying to stay monetized. It's getting really hard to stay monetized nowadays. So you're going to be hearing me use the word suggestive a lot. It just means adult things. Anyway, she calls him over to the couch in a very suggestive and like somewhat sexual manner. And she ends up putting on shows that are just like very clearly getting at something that she wants from Rocco. They began watching a show called the mating habits of cane toads which if it isn't clear bev and her husband ed are in fact cane toads just anthropomorphic versions of cane toads so with that in mind i think it's crystal clear what exactly she's trying to get to happen this episode is entirely based around these adult themes and humor and it's the reason why it was banned in the us and canada after only two airings what's hilarious though is that nickelodeon thought that maybe people were just not ready for the episode when it originally aired in 1993 so thinking that people might have a change of heart in their opinion nine years later in 2002 they actually rebroadcast the episode nicktoons tv aired the whole episode without any type of censorship which led it to getting banned once more. As of now, the episode exists on DVD and also a few streaming services. What's kind of sad about this episode and a lot of some of the other stuff on this iceberg is that a lot of them were banned due to tackling more serious and real topics. I've seen way too many marriages and relationships play out like this, where the husband acts as though he hates his wife and the wife not feeling loved at home goes and seeks attention elsewhere, leading to possible affairs and whatnot. Obviously, I don't think children should be exposed to this type of content at such an early age, but I do think most of us can appreciate what this episode sought to do. But I do agree, I think it was in bad taste to air this episode or even this series on a children's network. The Flintstones Winston Cigarette Commercial Yep, there is an actual commercial where your favorite Flintstones characters are seen smoking Winston cigarettes while their wives do yard work. And it wasn't just one commercial, not two commercials, but like six different commercials that aired in the 1960s on ABC. The most infamous one was a commercial where their wives were doing yard work and general housework while the men sat back and enjoyed a pack of smokes. There's no way in hell you could get away with doing this type of commercial branding nowadays. Imagine cartoon icons like Mickey Mouse or Spongebob advertising alcohol. It just doesn't sit right with me and it didn't sit right with a lot of people even during that time. And it also just doesn't even make sense to use children icons to sell adult products because the only people that are going to be receptive to that type of advertisement are children. And the fact that smoking is detrimental to your health and they were basically advertising it to children, it's completely obvious as to why this was taken off the air. As promoting that type of lifestyle to young impressionable kids is not the smartest idea. This is why the commercials only lasted so long and why they are seen as completely outdated by today's standards. In the same vein as the Donald Duck cartoon, these commercials were simply a product of their time. But even then, it's just crazy that some network executive thought this was a good idea. This is a piece of history because if you really think about it, this has to be one of the few times where a actual character from children's cartoons can be seen advertising this type of stuff. I know there's other ones out there, but this is just one of the more notable ones. That will bring us to layer five. Layer 5 contains more odd subject matter, from cartoon characters possibly doing drugs to tackling racial issues in the US. And no better place to start than with a very old yet classic cartoon, The Littlest Tramp. The main plot of this episode of Mighty Mouse entails a lady that is selling flowers that keeps getting undermined by this rich businessman. During one of these interactions, the businessman ends up crushing one of the flowers from the lady and Mighty Mouse takes the ashes from the flower and stuffs them in his pocket. Then later in the episode when Mighty Mouse takes out this crustacean, this happens. He takes out the ashes from earlier, thinking fondly of the flower girl and proceeds to sniff them, but ends up snorting them up his nose. This scene was the source of controversy before it even aired. Editor Tom Klein brought up this issue in board meetings, claiming that the scene looked too similar to another addictive substance that people snort up their nose, cocaine. Ralph Bakshi, the main producer of Mighty Mouse, was approached by tons of employees expressing their concern over this, and despite him believing that they were being too paranoid and overreacting, he ended up allowing them to cut the scene. 
However, the senior director at the time, John Chris Falusi, believed that the scene was harmless, and following this advice, the team decided to air the episode after it was approved by network executives. And it initially aired without any controversy on Halloween in 1987. But a little less than eight months later on June 8th of 1988, the head of the American Family Association, Donald Wildman, alleged that the episode did in fact depict cocaine usage which sparked a media frenzy. For this next part to make sense, you have to understand that Ralph Bakshi, who is the main producer of Mighty Mouse, also is notable for creating one adult film titled Fritz the Cat. The AFA used Bakshi's Fritz the Cat creation against him, insinuating that it was an example of his lustful mind, explaining that if someone can make that film, then they could certainly be trying their best to add adult-oriented scenes into their cartoons. And in corporate fashion, they completely missed the mark on what Fritz the Cat was actually trying to do. Fritz the Cat was a commentary and satire on the American college life of that era, the free love movement, racial issues, and served to criticize politics of the time. What's wild is that the AFA accused CBS of, and I quote, hiring a known worker in the adult industry to do this cartoon for children and then allowed him to insert a scene where the cartoon hero is shown doing cocaine. Ralph ended up defending himself by basically saying that you could go to any cartoon of that era pick out a few still images, and spin the story in a way that you would get the same impression. Here is exactly what he said after this. I despise drugs. I would be out of my mind to show a cartoon character snorting that in a cartoon. Another quote from him reads, Mighty Mouse was happy after smelling the flowers because it helped him remember the little girl who sold it to him fondly. But even if you're right, their accusations became part of the air we breathe. That's why I cut the scene. I can't have children wondering if Mighty Mouse is using cocaine. In the end, they did cut the scene, and to be fair, at least from the facts that I've read so far on this case, it does appear to be an innocent mistake on Bakshi's part. And this is reflected by CBS's actions after this, as many called for Ralph Bakshi to be removed from the team entirely. But on July 25th, 1998, they released a statement that was in complete support of him. Just one of those cases where what was thought to be an innocent mistake ended up being blown way out of proportion by way too many opinionated people, which is a classic internet tale as old as time. Gravity Falls in Kenya Gravity Falls is just straight up banned in Kenya due to its adult themes for it being a cartoon. I did find an article stating that Kenya's censorship board banned Gravity Falls as part of a six cartoon ban lineup, which included the Loud House, The Legend of Korra, Hey Arnold, Clarence, and of course, Gravity Falls. It appears to have been banned due to its inclusion of LGBT themes. What's interesting about this case is that Kenya only banned Gravity Falls in 2017, after the show had already ended. And the hammer was brought down only after some of the creators of Gravity Falls came out and basically confirmed that some of the characters were gay or lesbian. I don't know why, but this feels way worse than a normal case of LGBT censorship because in this one, it's very crystal clear that the only reason the show got banned was because some characters hint at their sexual orientation. The Legend of Dratini there exists a banned episode of Pokemon titled The Legend of Dratini. This episode has a pretty normal plot based all around Dratini and the man who discovered it, the warden of the Safari Zone named Kaiser. The reason this episode is so controversial is because of Kaiser's liberal use of his firearm that he has nicknamed Thunderbolt. Anytime Ash tries to question the man or anytime anyone in the group does something that rubs him the wrong way, boom face full of thunderbolt the episode aired in japan on november 25th of 1997 but it has not been aired anywhere else outside of asia due to it being banned obviously this was largely due to the pervasive use of firearms and i can totally see why you might think that jesse holding thunderbolt to this guy's head in this manner was photoshopped but it's not this is an actual scene from the episode and there's a constant amount of scenes where it's not just used as a threatening tactic but just straight up fired at some of the characters for kids entertainment which was the network that would air pokemon 
found this episode to have too many dark themes in it and decided to never air it, so it never got an English dub. The episode can be found online pretty easily, but as I said before, it is not in English. Even though I have found some very badly made, fan-made dubs of the episode. 4Kids Entertainment did end up using some snippets from the episode in their polka rap video, but they only used clips of Drutini, which was mainly just B-roll shots, so it's not like they put like the scene with the gun in there or anything. In the same class as the banned episodes of Steven Universe, this episode actually provided some much needed context for the plot of future episodes that were to follow. Viewers watching the next episodes of the series were confused as to why Ash suddenly had 30 of this Pokemon. The Legend of Drotini also explained Team Rocket's plan for a later episode, Ditto's Mysterious Mansion. There have been other controversial accusations to this episode, specifically Meowth's link to Hitler with his mustache design that they gave him. I think this is just adding fuel to the fire though, because based on his outfit in this scene, it looks more like a typical detective mustache more than anything. Heroes. Beavis and Butthead's 22nd episode of season two was met with a lot of controversy over, you guessed it, firearms. You're gonna see a lot of guns on here. Get used to it. This episode did go a little overboard with the firearm usage though. Beavis and Butthead walk into a gun shop and are asked if they are 18 years or older, to which they reply, uh, no. And within due time, they are able to start shooting and having their own fun, breaking a window, causing this car to wreck, and just all around start going crazy. They even take down a commercial airplane when Butthead misses the target that he's aiming for. And what's kind of disturbing about this scene is that they end up just leaving the victims in the plane to seemingly die, even when they are clearly begging for them to help. I don't think this really requires any further explanation as to why it was banned because I feel like most people can understand why this wouldn't be a good look for any network airing cartoons. Even for MTV standards, this was a bit out there and controversial for the time that it came out. One thing I wanted to touch on though before I move on was how hard it was to find this episode through conventional means. On Paramount Plus, there doesn't appear to be any episodes before season three, and even after season three, there's also a ton of episodes missing. Of course, you can still find them pretty easily on Google if you search hard enough, but I assume Beavis and Butthead was so mainstream that it would be the easiest thing to find clips on, but I guess I was wrong. I imagine some of the episodes are either missing due to them not being vaulted correctly, or just due to controversies that I'm just unaware of because this show does have a ton of adult themes in it. The Hunger Strike. Most likely not going to be showing any clips from this one as I want to avoid copyright, but this infamous episode comes from the boondocks. This episode did not see the light of day until nearly 12 years later after its posted scheduled air date. This was due to threatened legal action from BET the Black Entertainment Television Network. You might be wondering why exactly BET has anything to do with this, but if you've seen the episode, then you know exactly why they're involved. This is because the entire episode's plot is based around exposing and tearing down BET. The episode begins with the president of BET having a board meeting where they talk about how they are trying to destroy black culture and black people as a whole. In retaliation, Huey begins a hunger strike that will not end until BET shuts their network down. To outsiders that might have not seen the Boondocks or are not familiar with the Boondocks history with BET, you still might be confused as to why a real life network is involved in this fictional cartoon episode. The creator of the Boondocks, Aaron McGruder, is a vocal opponent of black entertainment television. Based on the episode, it's clear that the creators of the Boondocks feel as though BET is to blame for dumbing down black culture and boiling them down to clear stereotypes. And this episode, along with another episode titled Uncle Ruckus reality show are the culmination of their opinion on BET. Their strong message did end up getting both episodes banned. Most believe this is because of threatened legal action from BET because as I said earlier, that is what is stated to have happened. But this is actually somewhat incorrect. A news article from 2008 states that a Cartoon Network representative by the name of James Anderson released a statement via email that read, the two episodes you were asking about are not scheduled to air on Adult Swim. We really have no further comment, but you should know that neither Turner nor Adult Swim were contacted by BET, Miss Lee, or Mr. Hudlin. 
For those unaware, Turner is the parent company that owns Cartoon Network and Adult Swim, and if we choose to believe the spokesman, it does appear that the episode was pulled for other reasons. What those reasons were were unclear, but the episode did eventually broadcast on May 29th of 2020 and had a DVD release with some additional commentary from Magruder about the episode's creation. The Garbage Pale Kids Cartoon this is one of the few things on the iceberg that, for one, I didn't know existed, and two, was unjustifiably taken off the air. To explain this, we have to take a journey back into the 1980s, specifically to this man, Art Spiegelman. Art created the notorious and historical work, Mouse, which in my opinion is a very important comic that is a non-fiction graphic novel about Art's father's experience as a Holocaust survivor. Honestly, this novel could have its own video on it in the future, and I do plan on making one. The graphic novel became so popular in its heyday that it was even taught in schools for a time. The reason I even bothered mentioning this is because the notoriety from his work on Mouse led to him creating another project known as the Garbage Pail Kids. If you have a parent born in the late 1970s or the 1980s, then they're going to be hit with a wave of nostalgia when they hear about the Garbage Pail Kids. These trading cards are super infamous among children that were born around this era. They appeared all throughout the news during this time, showcasing how desperate children were to get their hands on some garbage pail kids. Parents did not take too kindly to these cards because of the art style for each card, each one displaying some comical abnormality, deformity, or a painful fate or death with some hilarious wordplay, such as Adam Bomb or Tommy Gun. These cards were quickly banned all throughout schools, but with how popular they were at the time, it was a no-brainer to try and make a Garbage Pail Kids cartoon to capitalize off the sudden popularity of the brand. The cartoon was pitched and produced by 1987 and featured an odd cast of gross-looking kids with abilities to help others. The show wasn't really that bad to be honest, it just appeared to be a normal kid show where these children use their special powers to assist those in need. The show actually didn't even end up airing at all in the United States as it was pulled a few days before its scheduled air date, replacing the empty slot with extra episodes of the Muppet Babies. CBS removed the entire series from their schedule due to protests surrounding children's television around the time, and since Garbage Pail Kids already had enough controversy when they were just simple trading cards, they did not want to add fuel to the fire. With some people believing the show appeared to ridicule the disabled and glorified violence, despite the show not even airing yet. I honestly feel like the censorship of the Garbage Pail Kids was a bit unwarranted, and the same goes for Art Spiegelman's famous novel, Mouse as that was also banned in 2022 in some schools. The cartoon did air everywhere else in the world, so it's not like it was completely unwatchable, just not watchable in the United States. Let me know if you also feel like the Garbage Pail Kids cartoon was banned unjustifiably. There is one other entry I'm supposed to go over on Layer 5 titled Shouju Subaki, but due to the content and the gore in that animation, I just don't think I would be able to get away with being monetized and adhere to ad guidelines on YouTube, so I've decided to probably make my own video on it. In fact, if you're watching this right now, I probably already have that video out, so go check that one out if you haven't already. I know I said I wasn't going to do more than two parts of this iceberg, but Given the length of the video, the amount of research that I've done, and the fact that I had a deadline to meet with a sponsor, I felt like it was necessary for me to cut this one a little bit short. Again, getting monetized on YouTube is becoming a lot harder, so if you guys really want to support me, go ahead and head on over to Patreon and support me on Patreon. I do have three tiers right now, and the second tier and above actually got to watch this video that you're watching right now one day early. And tier 3 patrons also get behind the scenes content that's exclusive to the Patreon and also a shout out in the credits of each video. Which brings me to the patron shout out. Thank you to the 3 members that have joined so far, I really cannot say enough. You guys are honestly the reason I'm able to do this as a job. Any type of support to the channel is always wonderful to have. Thank you guys so much for taking your time out of your day to not only just set up the Patreon, but actually choose the biggest tier that I have on there. I really appreciate it, and I hope that I am able to do you guys justice and bring you guys content on there that you love. With all that said, I will see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching.